Thank you for joining us for this evening's program on the fertility crisis. I'm Claire Noble, the Director of Programming for the Vail Symposium. On behalf of Chris Sable, our Executive Director, Dale Mosier, our Board Chairman, and the entire Vail Symposium Board, welcome. We're celebrating 50 years of convening locally and thinking globally. Two items to be aware of before we get started. Please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for tonight's speaker. You can type those in there at any time. We'll get to those later in the program and we'll get to as many as time permits. Tonight's program will run until 7 p.m. It's being recorded and you'll be able to find that recording at veilsymposium.org. I'd like to take just a moment to thank the organizations and individuals who've helped make tonight's program possible. Our sponsors are the Town of Vail, Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Antlers at Vail, and the Vail Daily. Our virtual programs are sponsored by Alpine Bank. Cindy Ingalls and Leela and Walt Misher have underwritten the summer season. Holly and Buck Elliott have underwritten the Environmental Awareness Series. And the underwriters for tonight's program are Mary Pat and Keith Rapp, Nancy Lynn and Doug Patton. The Vail Symposium is also supported by a generous grant from the Frechette Family Foundation. Thank you to all of our sponsors and donors. We couldn't do it without you. Our next program is on October 28th. It will be a great deci decisions discussion program on great power competition in the Arctic. And tonight we turn our attention to reproduction and fertility and why both may be imperiled. Our speaker has a long and distinguished career and you can find her more extensive bio on our website. In the interest of time, I'll be brief. Shauna Swan, PhD, is one of the world's leading environmental and reproductive epidemiologists. She's a professor of environmental medicine and public health at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, where she's also a member of the Transdisciplinary Center on Early Environmental Exposures and the Mindic Child Health and Development Institute. Welcome, Dr. Swan. We're so honored to have you join us this evening. And I'll turn the program over to you. And when you're ready for audience questions, you can check back in with me later in the program. Just a reminder to our audience, to please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Dr. Swan. Thank you, Claire. I'm happy to be here. Um, I wish I could be with you in person. Um, I think it's, I understand you have snow today. It should be pretty exciting and beautiful. Um, here in New York, um, it's 70 degrees. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen with you. And um, <clears throat> give me just a second. I bring this up and we get started. Okay, slideshow. Great. So um, I have a dramatic title, <clears throat> Dire Consequences, Why Humans May Be the Next Endangered Species. And um, I'm that, sorry, Dr. Swan, we're not seeing the slides yet. We're seeing a Zoom screen. Ah, uh, it says, okay, let's see. If I go stop sharing, I'm not sure what to do, Claire. This is what, what happened before. Here Which is. Would you uh, like to send me your slides and then I'll share them from my screen? It's not easy. It's not easy. They're very big. Um, and I don't have them in a Dropbox right now. Um, oh, there they are. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> All these technical difficulties, right? Now, now you're, everything is fine. Great. So um, let's get started. Um, so here's the roadmap for what I'm going to be talking about today. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the problem that the book Countdown addresses um, its causes and the consequences, and then some solutions. Of course, it's going to be a very quick synopsis of a very in-depth book, and I hope you read it, and, and I think you'll enjoy it. But let's get started with the problem. So the problem that the book and that I have been dealing with over the past 20 plus years is the problem of decreasing reproductive function. So how did I get into this? 
Well, back in the mid 90s, <clears throat> I was a member of a committee for, um, well, the, the committee was looking at the importance of endocrine disrupting chemicals, which we'll talk about on human health. And they wanted to know whether they should consider this paper, which came out in 92, 1992, which was very dramatic and claimed that there had been a genuine decline in semen quality over the past 50 years. Now, if you look at this graph, which is from that paper, it looks kind of spotty, right? The circles, which are the data points are kind of spread out and doesn't look very consistent. And the paper itself is very small and um, it doesn't have a lot of detail in it. And so when I read that, I said to the committee, I don't think this is going to stand up for, you know, under scrutiny, but I'll look at it. I took six months to do that. And to my surprise, nothing I could look at the way sperm were counted, the way men were included, their ages, their smoking, their whatever did not change to the first decimal plate, this slope of this decline. So I had to take this seriously. And I've been doing that for a long time. In 2017, I published a paper with my colleagues, uh, first author, um, Haggai Levine from Israel. <clears throat> And in that, we actually confirmed that decline that had been shown in 1992, but brought it up to date using modern methods and new data. And this time, people were not skeptical. They actually took it pretty seriously, as you can see from this Newsweek headline. The, sorry, the decline that we reported was strongest in Western countries. That's because not that that's where the problem is, that's where the data were, okay? So in order to do this study, you have to have the data points which were summarized across these years and across all the countries that we could that met and all the papers that met our criteria. But if the country did not conduct the studies, of course, we couldn't include them. And that was the problem for the non-Western countries. There just wasn't very much data. In Western countries, which includes North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, we saw this dramatic 52.4% decline in sperm concentration. And this was a decline from 99 million sperm per milliliter back in 1973 which is the first year of sample collection in this analysis, not publication, but collection, and went to 2011, which was the last year that we could include. That drop was from 99 million per milliliter to 47. You can do that math really quickly, because it's about half, right? <laughs> Going down about half, a little more than half. And this is 39 years. So this is faster than 1% per year, and it was, pretty alarming. Before I, I, I want to point out that there are some dotted lines at the end. And that's because people say to me, well, where is this going? And I always say, well, I don't have my crystal ball. However, there's a couple of things I can say. This curve cannot reach zero because it's the mean of sperm count. And if it were zero, then we'd have to have negative sperm, which we do not. Okay. And so what's gonna to have to happen is that this curve can come closer and closer and closer to zero, but never reach it. Hopefully it won't get that close and it'll start to turn around more or less. So these are the three predictions I have, but touching zero is actually not one of them, <laughs> okay? Now, what about non-Western countries? Well, we hope to have more data for you soon, but right now we have to use the published meta-analyses from other regions. And one example of this is in Africa. Um, you see this data from Africa. This was published in the same year as our study, 2017. And you see the decline is considerably steeper than what we reported. So I can assure you that the decline that we talked about is not limited to Western countries. And it's also not limited to just sperm count, and it's not limited to just men. So how does that look? Well, if we just, sorry, if we just focus on males, 
we can talk about sperm count, but there's other things that are going on. And I'll talk about the size of the genitals a little bit later. There's also reduction in testosterone. There is an increase in male genital birth defects. And on the female side, there are problems as well. So there's an increase in miscarriage. There's an increase in early puberty, an increase in premature ovarian failure, loss of eggs, basically, um, increases in endometriosis, menstrual problems, premature birth. So this is, um, you know, everybody's involved in this, men and women, and later I'll show you not just humans. And when we think about endpoints that actually encompass both male and female components, then we're talking about infertility. That's a couple endeavor for, you know, conceiving a child. Ambiguous genitalia can be seen in both men and women. Hormone abnormalities, particularly lower of lowering of testosterone is an issue for females as well. And that's accompanied by low libido and germ cell damage. That's the damage to the sperm and eggs that will develop in the next generation and failure of assisted reproduction. These are all problems that we're dealing with. And I like to say there we are viewing the 1% effect where everything is, if you will, going down going to hell in a handbasket, if you want to say that, at about 1% per year. And um, here is the sperm decline in Western countries. This is total fertility rate. I'll talk about that in a minute. And this is miscarriage rate. So the fertility rate, as anybody who's thought about this will immediately say, and I get this all the time, well, fertility is down because people are choosing not to have as many children. This is certainly true. That is a major contributor. However, we also know that it's going down because even young women who want to have children are having more difficulties. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time addressing these issues of the declines in the total fertility rate, which is, by the way, the number of children that a woman is expected to have over her lifetime, which has dropped, which has dropped 50% in 50 years. So um, this is a big decline and there's a lot of loaded issues around it. Some people say it's a good thing, too many people, too many children in the world. Um, I would suggest to you that a couple that is trying to get pregnant is not going to be happy with knowing that this, hearing that this is a good thing. And I believe that a couple that wants to have a child should have that right. So let's talk about some of the causes of these problems. So the first thing I'd like to mention is genetics. And I'm mentioning it because I want to put it aside. Um, we're looking at changes, say a 50% drop in sperm concentration over two generations. 50 years is approximately two generations. This is, and it's actually a little faster than that. This is too fast for evolutionary change. And while there may be some interactions of genetics and environment, I'm sure there are, genetics alone will not explain the trends that I'm talking about. So the other half of the puzzle, genetics and environment. What about environment? Well, environment is complex and it, involves lots and lots of factors. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk about some of them. But first, I'd like to mention lifestyle factors. So lifestyle factors are things that we have some control over. And for example, poor foods, fatty foods are not good for fertility and reproduction. Binge drinking is not good for fertility and reproduction. Neither is stress, which is, of course, much more difficult to control, particularly now. Heat is an issue, which is a growing problem in our world. Um, obesity is a problem for fertility and lack of exercise. So these are some examples of lifestyle factors that can affect men's and women's reproductive potential, can affect sperm count, can affect the probability of conceiving. But I'm not going to spend any more time on these because these are relatively simple and actually controllable for the most part. I'm going to talk about the harder issues, which is the chemical exposures. 
and particularly the endocrine disrupting chemicals. So what are endocrine disrupting chemicals? These are chemicals I like to call hormone hackers. These are chemicals that act like our body's natural hormones. So they can act like an estrogen, they can be estrogenic, they can act like testosterone or they, they can decrease testosterone. So they can be pro-estrogenic, anti-androgenic and possibly the converse. Um, and what characterizes them is that they are very sneaky in that they get into our bodies and we'll talk about how Without our knowledge, we have no knowledge of this. And if I asked you to tell me what you're, you can tell me whether you smoked today or recently, or whether you drank and what medications you took, but you cannot tell me what phthalates you've been exposed to, what bisphenols you've been exposed to, and so on and so forth. So we have no knowledge of these. And I, they're very, that's why they're, I sometimes call them stealth chemicals. They get in under the radar without our knowledge, and then they do damage. So what are these? Well, here are some classes of ones that have been pretty well studied. I'm sure there are many, many others because there are up to 100 hormones in the body. And if any of them can be affected by an environmental chemical, you can see it's very difficult to tease out all the chemicals affecting all the hormones, which hormones they're affecting. So we don't really know the extent of EDCs, but we know enough of them that we can, should be worrying about them. And the ones that I am going to talk most about are the phthalates. Those are chemicals that make plastic soft and flexible. Um, and the phenols, the bisphenols, make plastic hard. Um, the PFAS chemicals are barrier chemicals. I'll give you some examples, pesticides, flame retardants. Let's take a look at some of these. So the um, barrier chemicals, um, one example that I think a lot of people know is the nonstick pans. And <clears throat> these emit um, PFAS chemicals, which can be pretty damaging to many functions in the body, including hormone function, such as uh, thyroid function, immune function. Um, the rubber duckies here are representing a class of phthalates that phthalates that make plastic soft and flexible, like these rubber duckies. They can also be in water bottles, making those soft. They can also be in shower curtains. And shown down here, they can also be in cosmetics because they hold scent and color, and they also increase absorption, like that hand cream that you put on your hand. The phthalates in there will help it go into your body. And then there's flame retardants, which is a very scary class of chemicals that um, interfere with, for example, thyroid function and immune function. And pesticides have been known to be damaging to our body's hormones since Rachel Carson pointed out their effects on um, reproduction a long time ago in Silent Spring. And then there's the bisphenols, which are lining tin cans. They're also in cash register receipts. They're also in pizza boxes. And these are kind of the bad twin of the phthalates. Phthalates makes plastic soft and flexible and are anti-androgenic, lowering testosterone. And the bisphenols make plastic hard and they are pro-estrogenic. So and these are not absolute, these hormonal functions, but that's generally how they're characterized. So there's many of them, and we'll talk a little bit more about their exposure, you know, exposure to them and what you can do about it. But basically, they're everywhere. They're everywhere, and we don't know about it, and there's no way to totally avoid them. So let's talk about what, sorry, I'm, what we can do, uh, why we're worried about, why I'm worried about phthalates. Okay, my particular focus has been on phthalates <clears throat> ever since a friend on a plane going to Japan to a meeting said to me, Shana, you should look at phthalates. And I said, what are phthalates? It was at the time that nobody really knew about phthalates. It was back around 1999 and at that point, the Centers for Disease Control had set up these systems to measure these chemicals at low levels in lots of people for not very much money. And that 
system, which is still ongoing, I still do annual or biannual um, surveys of the levels of these chemicals in the bodies of US citizens, they showed that phthalates were in everybody, pregnant women, young men, children, everybody. So that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that um, John told me, and in the toxicology program called the National Toxicology Program, they have shown that these chemicals can interfere with male reproductive function. So I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. Let me look into that. And the, what I learned was that this undifferentiated sex organ, just a schematic, just a cartoon, if you will, but think about the developing fetus in very early pregnancy, the male and female genital organs do not look the same. Sex organs do not look different, sorry. When testosterone comes along, about weeks, we think eight, 10 of pregnancy in the humans, we know which days in the rat, <clears throat> then the male genitals start to develop. This is the genetic male. And for example, here is shown the testicles, which will later descend. Without the presence of testosterone, there will be the ovaries, and this, this will be the female default. So really, testosterone is added on to the undifferentiated sex organ and produces the male, and without that, you will have the female default. So that's sort of a new way of looking at this. And so what can interfere with that testosterone? So if you look at it, unexposed mom, this is a rat who has no phthalates in the picture. So she has a phthalate free, <laughs> free life um, while she's pregnant and her male will experience the surge of testosterone in these days, um, 18 to 21, 22. That's normal. If she's exposed to phthalates, in this study it was diethyl hexyl phthalate, that peak, that critical peak for male development, in order to differentiate male from female genitals, is wiped out. Okay? This is absolutely critical, so I hope you could get this. Females are not affected. They are not looking for this peak, and they are not altered by the absence of the peak but this is a story about the male. So what happens when the mother is exposed, in this case to diethyl hexyl phthalate, the most anti-androgenic or testosterone lowering phthalate, then her male offspring develops something which was termed the phthalate syndrome. And that's comprised of smaller genitals, possibly malformed genitals, undescended testicles, and a shortening of a distance, which I have spent a lot of time studying called the anogenital distance. This is not a term that most people know about. It is a term that's used for toxicology and has been used for toxicology for over 100 years. But it hadn't been used in human toxicology until we used it. So here's the story. Mothers exposed to phthalates, during pregnancy at the right time, the male offspring develop in a way that is less male typical in the rat. So being an epidemiologist, I work with people. I asked, is this happening in humans? In particular, are we seeing a shortening of this anogenital distance, which turns out to be sort of the key marker of this syndrome. And what is that? Well, here's a picture of it. Um, not a great picture, but it makes the point that the male anogenital distance is a lot bigger than the female. And this is true of most mammalian anogenital distance, AGD in most mammals. Actually, the hyena is a little different. But other than that, this is the story. And in a, in a laboratory, when the pups are born, the Scientists will pick up the pup by the tail and look at this distance, and you can just see, I've done this, 
if it's long or short. And then you put the males in the male box and the females in the female box. And that's how you can decide who's a male and a female. So it's really, really critical. And what we found was that when we looked in humans and looked for that distance, we found that it was decreased in human male infants when the mother was exposed to prenatal phthalates. Now, this, is, this slide summarizes almost 20 years of work because think about what we had to do. We had to somehow figure out what was the mother's prenatal phthalate exposure? Well, we had urine actually from pregnant women so that we could look at that. Then we had to get their offspring bring them in and measure what wasn't clear because that never been done. We wanted to measure in these human infants something analogous to what had been measured in the in the rodents, right? And so we designed this exam to look at this and we measured it. And what we found out that when mothers had more phthalates in their urine prenatally, their sons had a shorter anal general distance. And we saw no effect on the females and we were not expecting that. Now, we had to replicate this because that's what you do. And so we did another study designed specifically to look at this. We got urine at the right time. Actually, we got it in each trimester and we got the babies to come in right at birth, just like the rats had been exposed, you know, were looked at right after birth. And we came very close to mimicking that rodent study, and we found this again. So we had two studies that confirmed the hypothesis that the phthalate syndrome exists in humans. What does this have to do with sperm count? And what about these male infants? Are they malformed? Are they strange? Actually, no. If you look at the children in our study, none of them looked abnormal. You would not think there was anything wrong with their development by just looking at them. You have to make this very careful measurement, but it turns out that it actually matters for development. So it turns out that males with a short anogenital distance, remember that's less masculine, less male typical, actually had more birth defects of their genitals. They had a smaller penis, they had less descent, less complete descent of the testes, and there were consequences when they matured as well. And I'm sorry, this is actually weirdly, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, um, right, so, okay. So now, I'm sorry, that there's a, bit of, a little bit of problem with the order of these slides for some reason, but we're, we're, we're fine, we're doing fine. Um, so now I'm gonna tell you that the timing of this actually matters a lot. You saw in that picture that the peak in testosterone occurred in a very narrow window. And it turns out that's true. And when the exposure is earlier than that or later than that, it actually doesn't matter. So here's the window in rats. It's from day 15 to 18, and that's called the male programming window. But if you only expose them early or you only expose them late, you don't see this change. So th this animal study told us that there was a specific time probably for humans as well. And so we looked at that. And what we found by getting urine in three trimesters was that the exposure in the first trimester was the one that was associated with a decrease in this anogenital distance, whereas exposure in the second trimester and the third trimester didn't really matter. So now we have the exposure matters, it matters when it is. And the other thing to remember about timing is that the changes that occur when the fetus is in the womb, such as these changes or changes induced by paternal or maternal smoking are permanent. So when the father smokes around the time of conception, people will be surprised to know that that could affect the development of his son's sperm count perhaps, but his, the sperm that's going to conceive that pregnancy has been developing in the 
70 days before conception. So if he's smoking in that time, turns out his son will have a 40% lower sperm count on average. If the mother smokes when she's pregnant, her son will have a 40% lower sperm count on average. If he smokes, he will have a 20% lower sperm count. But here's the kicker. If he stops smoking, he can restore his sperm function. But there's nothing to be done about the exposure that he got from his mother or his father. So timing is really critical in this respect as well. So now let me tell you why this all matters. It turns out that when this distance is longer, the man that grew up from that child with the, with the anogenital distance that we measured will have a longer, a higher sperm count. And when the distance is shorter, he'll have a lower sperm count. How do we know that? Well, we couldn't measure sperm count in our babies because we didn't have 20 plus years to wait. So we did the next best thing. We got college students in Rochester, New York to come in and give us a sperm count and let us measure their AGD. And when we did that, we saw this very nice correlation and which demonstrates that that early exposure to phthalates, which affects anogenital distance, is also going to play out in his adult life, impacting his sperm count. And Mike Eisenberg showed that this is also true in a California population, but in what, he, what was important, what he contributed here was that it was also related to fertility. So the childless men had a shorter anogenital distance than the fathers. So now we have anogenital distance related to some defects like undescended testicles. Actually, there, it's also related to another defect called hypospadias. And now we know it's related to sperm count and fertility. A recent study just showed it was also related to testicular cancer. So what this means is that what's happening in that early critical window of programming of the male genitals, which is in the first trimester for humans, is setting up that man for success or failure reproductively in his later life. Really profound. very <laughs> frustrating. Um, the, okay, so another consequence of having a low sperm count, and this is a real surprise, is that men who have a low sperm count actually die on average at a younger age. This is really, really surprising. And it's true whether or not he's had a child. It's more marked if she's, he's never had a child, but it's also true if he did have a child. And that's because his disease, his risk of heart disease and obesity and other diseases and uh, reproductive cancers are all greater if he's had a low sperm count. So you see then that this early exposure affecting anogenital distance is also affecting his later life, not only his sperm count and his fertility, but his entire life's health and eventual mortality. So this is pretty dramatic effects of a small, very small prenatal exposure. But there's also an effect for the population that I just want to point out here. This is not from my study, but just to point out that what's happening when we have this decrease in sperm count and other reproductive failures, we are, as I mentioned, affecting fertility. And what's happening then is that the population is being affected, right? So what you see in 1960, this happens to be Japan is the very striking example of this. There was this pyramid, which has the base of the young people under 15 is very broad. And then you have this triangle in the middle, which is people of working age. And then you have older people. And this is the way the pyramid, that's why it's called a pyramid, because this is the way it used to look. 
But now it's looking like this, less and less like a pyramid. And the projection is that by 2060, it's going to look like this. This has huge social implications. You can imagine that when you don't have the children down here, you know, you're going to have fewer people in the workforce and with life expectancy being longer and longer, you're going to have more and more people on top. And we're not going to have the, these people are not going to provide the resources to support these people. And we're already seeing threats to Social Security, Medicare, and so on. So this story is not only a story about reproductive function, it's also a story about social and you know, population dynamics. So what are some of the consequences and then the solutions? All right, first of all, it's important to know that people really care about this. And there was a survey, a Nelson survey, and over 72% of millennials said they would spend more on a product if it came from a socially or environmentally responsible brand. So if we can make these changes I'm suggesting, people will buy these products and we can start to curtail this catastrophe that I think is we're facing. So what should we do? First of all, we have to remove chemicals that are endocrine disrupting chemicals that are hormonally active. This is, you can imagine, a huge task. We haven't even identified them all, but that's what we have to do if we're going to stop them. Um, we have to remove the chemicals that cause harm at low doses. This is really tricky because the way that chemicals are regulated right now is that it's assumed that more of a bad thing is worse and that as you decrease the dose, you get into a safer and safer range. And the problem with that is that many of these chemicals, which act like hormones, follow some of the principles of endocrinology. And in endocrinology, it's well known that dose responses are not monotonic. They don't just go in one direction. It is not true that more is necessarily worse, that less is better. And we actually know that from our own experience, because if you think about some of the things like exercise, and I mentioned alcohol, if there's a sweet spot, let's take exercise. If you over-exercise, a woman can actually stop menstruating, a man can interfere with his fertility. If you under-exercise couch potato behavior, you will also impair fertility. And in the middle is the sweet spot, which is optimal. That's true for many, many exposures and particularly when the outcomes involve endocrinology. So we have to look at the harm at low doses because those harms may be different from the harms at high doses. Then we have to worry about environmental persistence because these chemicals, many of them, will stick around our, our environment and come back to re-expose us. And now we're now facing, some of you may have read about, heard about um, the microplastics that are coming back uh, from the recycled products we're wearing now and the products that we're using. Those microplastics are entering our body. They are actually found in um, placenta. They're found in stool. They're found in many body tissues. So they are persisting and they persist in the environment and they persist in us. And we have to stop this cycle. And we have to deal with chemicals that have not been tested for toxicity. Actually, the majority of the chemicals in commerce have never been tested at all. They were grandfathered in under the consumer protection, of, under TSCA. Um, and if they had been there for a long time and on the shelves and in commerce, they were just let in with people saying, well, they've been around a long time and they don't seem to cause any harm. And so we'll just let them be. And so they were never tested. That's for the majority of chemicals. And we have to replace those with chemicals that are without endocrine disrupting effects. So those that are not hormonally active and free of low dose adverse effects and not environmentally persistent and shown to be safe 
prior to marketing. In, currently in this country, chemicals do not have to be shown to be safe prior to marketing. That is not the case in the EU. They have regulations called REACH that do require that manufacturers test their products and show them to be safe before they are marketed. In the EU, there are 1,100 chemicals banned from personal care products. In the US, there are 11. It's just not the same level of regulation. So we have to get on the ball here and test chemicals prior to marketing. And we have to regulate properly. And in particular, we have to look for low dose effects. We have to look for mixture effects. What, what's mixtures? Well, that's obvious, I think, that multiple chemical exposure. But we're not really, you know, those are not tested. Uh, usually chemicals are tested one at a time. And that's not going to reveal their harm because it turns out that these chemicals act synergistically, that the whole is worse than the sum of its parts. And some of you might think about when you go to a doctor and you, she wants to give you a new prescription, and she might say, tell me all the medications you're taking, and you'll tell her, and then she'll have sense, some sense of whether what she's going to prescribe is going to work well with those exposures that you're already you know, taking. So we have to regulate those mixtures. It's been shown that mixtures of say phthalates, seven phthalates at very low non, you know, safe levels, when the animal is exposed to all seven of them has significantly increased risk of general defects. So testing them one at a time is not going to do it. We have to look for environmental persistence and we have to look for risks in the untested chemicals that we're swimming in every day. So I want to say just a little bit about the um, what can we do about this? And I should say that my book, Countdown, has several chapters about this, but there are, it's such a hard job. And I think that people really, what they have to do is they have to become aware of the fact that we have this constant exposure that's everywhere and just recognize it. That's the first step recognize that this is something that's imperiling our reproductive health. A, a very practical thing you can do is you can walk through your kitchen, maybe with a big plastic bag, and look for the things that are stored in plastic, mixed in plastic, cooked in plastic, microwaved in plastic, absolutely the worst thing you can do, and maybe throw those away and replace them with glass and ceramic um, metal, and you'll decrease a lot of your exposure. You can buy foods, and this is difficult, you might not have this in your neighborhood, but if you can buy unprocessed foods, you'll be much safer because the processing of foods introduces these exposures into our lives, um, especially if you buy the organic, <clears throat> because that way <clears throat> you're free of the pesticides and the phthalates that are actually in the pesticides. Um, and you'd like to not buy tin cans, if possible, unless they are BPA free. So you can look for the BPA free label, but be careful because there's a good chance that it doesn't have BPA, but it has BPF or BPS, which are these substitutes that have been put in that do the job and also have the risk, but they can still be labeled BPA free. So it's a little tricky. Um, if you want to ask specific products about specific products, you can go to the Environmental Working Group web website and put your product in there and you'll get a ranking of the personal care product, the cleaning product, the laundry product, the sunscreen, um, which will give you some confidence that you are buying something that's safer for you. So I think, you know, have an awareness of this and um, make your best effort, but you know, don't go crazy. Don't let you know 
the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? You can't do everything, you can only do the best you can. And so I would also suggest you buy Countdown. Um, and we have much, you know, a lot of details about what you can do to improve um, the quality of your life and your reproductive health. And so that will mean your overall health. Um, and thank you, and I'll answer your questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Swan. And I just wanted to show everybody a copy of your book. Um, it's, um, it's definitely a hair raising book, um, but very important. And I loved that at the end, you did give us some, some solutions and some way to have agency um, to address this problem. And I just want to let everybody know that that website is ewg.org, the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. So our first question comes from Clint. And what he's asking about is the data from other countries. And I know you addressed this at the very beginning, but he, he specifically asked about China, India, Mexico. And I'm just wondering if that data is starting to get better. Yes, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, I'm happy to say. Um, since we published our, our meta-analysis in 2017, um, we have gone back and we've looked at the literature and there's been a huge influx in studies coming in from non-Western countries. So we're actually in the process of looking at that and we hope to come out with a new meta-analysis before too long. But um, what we're seeing is that fortunately, you know, we have this more recent data and I showed you the curve in Africa. There's a similar curve in China. So there are trend studies from individual countries that, and by the way, I have not ever seen a trend study of semen quality that shows an increase. Mm -hmm. There's some people who've said, well, this is just random fluctuation. It's just like, you know, it goes down, it goes up, who knows, we're looking at a little blip. No, we're not. It, every study of sperm decline has shown a similar trend. Well, Clint has another thing he wanted to point out, which I think is um, very troubling, and that's that the amount of plastic plumbing being installed in new construction, he thinks it might be in the range of 90% of new construction. Um, so his contention is that exposure will continue and perhaps increase. Yes. Um, this is really alarming and it's, it's correct. Um, there's PVC um, and phthalates are a component of PVC in, in water pipes, new water pipes everywhere in new construction. And um, there's um, really, you know, what we have to do is we have to convince the suppliers and we have to go to the supply chain and see where the chemicals are being introduced into into the products far up in the supply chain. So that's where it's going to have to start. There are alternatives, there are safer products. But uh, for example, I'm working with a company that's um, focusing on um, products in the healthcare industry and they are working very hard to replace the phthalate containing tubing that's used in the hospital, in IV bags, in the NICU, in the PICU and in dialysis. These all contain phthalates. They all introduce phthalates into the patient's body, okay? This company is working specifically to swap those out for phthalate-free tubing. The same thing can be done in construction. It's just really, really difficult. You need a company like the one we're working with motivated to do that. One of the things that you mentioned just now, and you also go into a little bit more detail in your book, is about the fact that the EU has much stiffer regulation around these chemicals than the United States does. I've got to believe that's somewhat frustrating. Lauren has a question wondering if there are some areas in Oregon or you know San Francisco that might have more strict regulations that are lacking at the federal level. Have you seen any evidence of that? I don't know about Oregon, but California certainly has better regulations. There's Prop 65, for example, there are whole agencies in California, the Cal EPA is devoted to looking at these problems. California is much more active, probably the most active state in the country and um, leading the way as they do uh, for, for many areas of regulation. 
Um, but um, you need to get busy in Colorado now to um, get your legislature to, um, you know, start introducing these these regulations as well. Georgie is wondering where does endometriosis come into this discussion? I think that was mentioned on that Venn diagram where you showed right. how it affects men and women. How is endometriosis affected by these chemicals? I actually, sorry that I don't have a specific answer to that. I know that it's increasing. I know that it's hormonally active, but I personally have not studied it. And so I can't, as I'm sitting here, tell you exactly which chemicals are related to endometriosis, but you can actually Google that and you'll get quite good information if you put in endometriosis and endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, we don't have time, I don't think, to do it now, but um, it's, you know, you can get some information that way. And I believe we have some references in the book to that as well. I just don't have it at my fingertips. Susie's asking about benzene. Is benzene a, a phthalate? It is not. It is not. Okay. And I actually, I, sorry. I'm sorry, go Yeah, it, it is not a phthalate um, and it is not a plasticizer. Um, and actually, I hate, to, I hate to say again, there's, so, I mean, there's a lot of things I don't know. And, and I, I'm not familiar with the chemical action of benzene or its hormonal disruptive properties, but it's very possible it is a, an endocrine disruptor. One of the happen. concepts that you address in your book is uh, fertility, infertility, and then subfertility. Can you make a distinction between these three areas? Sure. That's very, very confusing terminology. So fertility, which I use for that graph I put up there, is a demographic term. Demographers use that. And it's, the, as I said, the number of children that a woman or a couple is expected to have in their lifetime, right? But that's not the opposite of infertility. <laughs> So mm -hmm. infertility occurs when a couple has tried for at least a year to conceive without contraception and not been successful. That's the criteria for infertility. Subfertility is decreased fertility. But what's most useful, I think, is the concept of fecundability. And I think that's what most people think about when they think about fertility. What is your ability to get pregnant? All right. And so that's measured in a couple of ways. The most, the, the best one, I think, what most difficult to, to tease out in studies is um, the time to pregnancy. So if you really knew how many cycles you tried without contraception to get pregnant until you did get pregnant, that's your time to pregnancy, right? And the longer the time to pregnancy, the lower the fecundability. And what we see is when sperm count drops below around 40, then the fecundability drops off really quickly and it takes longer and longer to conceive a pregnancy. That's why that number 47, which showed up in 2011, was so disturbing because it's very close to 40. And once we hit 40, that chance of conceiving in any cycle goes down very, very quickly to zero. So we just think about 99 to 47 and bringing us so close to this critical cutoff is, is alarming. Yeah. You were mentioning uh, perhaps, you know, getting rid of plastics in your, your kitchen and, and eating organic. Have you come across a, a fertility friendly diet? Ah, well, that's a great question. There's two issues in there. One is, um, the foods themselves and then how they're cooked right and so there's we did a study um with our rochester young men by the way um and we asked them what they ate we used the harvard food frequency questionnaire and and we found that when they ate a lot of fruit and vegetables that were organic pesticide free their sperm count went up they had a higher sperm count. When they ate fruit and vegetables that were not pesticide free, it didn't help them at all. So it's both eating the fruit and vegetables and being sure they're pesticide free. If you were cooking them in a 
Teflon pan or, you know, storing them in plastic, there would be other things to worry about. But this is just leaving those things out of it. That's just pesticide. So, so it's the food and then how it's cooked, how it's processed, how it's stored that affects your risk. Dr. Swan, we're just about out of time. I do want to give you, you know, the final word. Uh, you mentioned that Colorado probably needed to maybe get its act together in terms of, um, you know, perhaps stronger regulations. Um, what would you like the audience to take away from your talk this evening? Well, um, I would like the audience to be aware of the problem and on a personal level. So I would love, I don't know the age of your audience, but, but men particularly should probably know their sperm count. They should probably, you know, because it's an indicator of their overall health, just like you know your cholesterol and your blood pressure, you should know your sperm count. And um, that's one thing. The other thing is that I would like men to realize that when there are reproductive failures, it's a joint proposition. It's the man and the woman. And I think you know that women have been blamed for a long, long time for reproductive failures. And in fact, we're learning now that the man and the woman are kind of contributing equally to this situation. So um, be kind to your partner and, and help them to avoid bad exposures and avoid bad exposures to yourself. And, um, yeah, it'll be more successful that way, I think. <laughs> and kind Dr. S Dr. Swan, her latest book is Countdown. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And thank all of you at home for joining us. We'll be off next week, but our next program is on October 28th. And it is a great decisions discussion program on great power competition in the Arctic. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Swan. <laughs>